All right, so welcome to Everything You Know About Samurai is Bullshito. Because <laughs> uh, it really is. So this actually started, my name, so first off, sorry, introductions, my name is Mari. I actually had lived in Japan for several years. When I came back from Japan, I went to UT. I got my master's degree with a focus on Japanese history. Um, this actually started because despite my background, I became a fourth grade teacher. Um, one of the things, of course, you have to do when you are a teacher is read a lot of kids' books. And there was a Magic Treehouse book about samurai, and I read it, and I was not impressed. Uh -oh. The other thing that came about was the depiction of the Japanese players in Ready Player One. When one of them dies and the other one said, oh no, he would never commit seppuku. It's like, that wasn't seppuku. That really wasn't. So, a lot of this just goes into some really old Western myths that we hold about samurai, and we can trace a lot of that back to one person. So, let's get into it. So before, though, we get started and I crush all your hopes and dreams about becoming a samurai, <laughs> how would you describe a samurai? Like, give me, go, give me some, some adjectives. Like, what would you say a samurai is? Warrior. A warrior. Honorable. All right. Honorable. Sorry, what? Badass. Stoic. Stoic. Badass. What you got? Okay. Okay, we're getting like an artist, poet. There actually, I will, there was a lot of art and poetry all involved. Lots of culture going, all right. So we're getting the idea that we normally have is, is the strong, silent warrior with a soft side for romance and poetry and a strong sense of right and wrong. I'm kind of, kind of getting the feel here, right? Tom Cruise. Yeah. Tom Cruise, I go into him. I go into him. Give me a minute. <laughs> Gotta wait close to the end. Give me a minute. Alright, so the samurai class was abolished um, at the end of the Edo period, but just for fun, let's pretend that um, the samurai class is alive and well today and for some reason has migrated over to the United States. So, which one of these do you think would be a modern day samurai? Just raise your hand. So, an old man, an old scholar, do you think this would be a samurai? All right. How about a woman? Could a woman be a samurai? All right, take a couple of hands there. How about children? Could children be samurai? All right. How about a person, like a member of the military, especially the elite forces? Okay. Awesome. How about an accountant? Can an accountant be a samurai? Mm. How about some frat bros? <laughs> <laughs> the correct answer is all of them. Samurai was a class. It encompassed women and encompassed children and encompassed people who we don't really consider to be exemplifying the behavior that we would expect of a samurai. So let's go ahead and just do a quick and dirty history because the history of samurai is very long and storied. Um, I'm just really just breaking down a lot of myths here. So, first up, really quick and dirty. So the samurai class developed actually in 646 AD. They were a very low ranking members of a conscription army. Um, they evolved into more of a warrior class during the Heian and the Kamakura periods of, in Japanese history. They're kind of a warrior nobles, but they weren't really anything notorious until the Battle of Da no Ura in 1185. So this was a huge turning point battle for Japan and the uh, generals of the army told them that if they won this army, if they, if they won this battle, if they survived the battle, they would be known as the nobles, the elite, the samurai. Well here's the thing, the Japanese army, for a very long time, was a conscription army. Are you male? Are you of a certain age? Congratulations, you're in the military. Go have fun. And the army as well was BYOW. Bring your own weapon. Weapons were very, very ridiculously expensive. If you didn't have a sword, good luck, because you ain't gonna afford one. Essentially, the samurai class developed from whose grandpa had the sharper stick. So, 
After the Battle of Dan no Ura, the samurai clans were waging war among each other for the ruling power over Japan. Eventually, the Tokugawa shogunate takes over, and we get the first peaceful era in Japanese history, the Edo period. So they've gone from this brutal military fighting class, and then there are no wars. And there are no wars for a very, very long time. So what happens when you've got a military, you've got nobody to fight. What happens there is that peace means no wars, so all of these samurai are unemployed. We've got all of these guys with these fantastic fighting skills who've got nothing to do. That is a bad recipe. Something's gonna happen there. So the samurai, as they are nobles, they are eligible to take up uh, posts in the bureaucracy of the shogunate. So they're doing the, the accounting, the storage, all of that. But there aren't enough posts to go around. Now at this time in Japanese history, the shogunate um, they determined how much rice you got and when you got it and um, the portions depended on how many people were in your family, the, what the highest ranking member of your family did, they got more food, um, all kinds of things. But there's not enough to go around and you need to get these bureaucratic posts to get the food. So uh, Japan, uh, the samurai are kind of looking a little bit like this, <laughs> a little more like that though. <laughs> so there is very little food. There is lots of unemployment. We are starting to lead things into one of my other favorite topics, crime. Uh -oh. Because of the Ronin, and a lot of you going, oh, you know, you're watching anime, you're seeing like the, the Ronin is the honorable character without a master. No, 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 no. As you can see, I put, I put that using using uh, Greek, the Greek alphabet, because haha, I was in a sorority, but yeah, frat boy stuff. So the Ronin, yeah, the Ronin are starting to be known for being the nobles with the bad behavior. This is why I bring up the frat boy stuff. They start going around, they're drinking, they're gambling, they are the earliest form of the Yakuza. Uh, <laughs> hell yeah, organized crime, go! Oh. Right. So, both the Ronin and the, and the employed samurai as well, um, they like to go to Kabuki. Now, my, a lot of my master's degree uh, had to do with Kabuki and I wrote a very long and very terrible paper about it, but it got me to graduate, so <laughs> nothing there. Um, Kabuki was the Shakespeare of the time, and when I say Shakespeare, I don't mean the way that we regard Shakespeare today as this highbrow form of entertainment. No, this this was like 90 minutes of dick jokes. It really was. So it's really, really raunchy. So they go to uh, visit Kabuki, they go to Yoshiwara, which is the pleasure quarter. That's all of the brothels, it's all of the gambling, all of the drinking. And the shogun is looking and realizing that these people that are supposed to be held in such high esteem are acting like they're 12 year olds with a whole lot of money. So he issues this huge decree that you cannot be a samurai and be anywhere near Yoshiwara, you cannot see any kabuki, you can't do the things you want to do because you got nothing else to do. Of course, the samurai were sneaking around that. Now, keep in mind, the shogunate, of course, has secret police. He has non-secret police. He's got spies all over the place looking for samurai who are breaking the rules. So how do you get past this huge, encompassing decree and not shame your family? And the answer is really, really simple. Hats. <laughs> You will see, especially if you look at a lot of old woodblock prints of Yoshiwara, you will see a lot of dudes wearing these giant hats that hide their faces. If you can't see their face, you don't know who they are. Or in a lot of cases, I know you've seen pictures of like celebrities who like change their haircut and you can't recognize them. It's the same thing, but on a hat, you look completely different. I tie my hair back, everyone thinks I look 20 years younger. I mean, it's a whole thing. So. You see it a lot in anime too. When you have a samurai character who is trying to sneak past something, they put on a hat. <laughs> All right. Let's go into some of the little known bad boys of samurai. Um, this one is actually not terribly well known and I am sad for it. So, whoops. 
That is not the button. This is the button. All right, so this is Katsu Koikichi. Otherwise, he's a Buddhist name at the end of his life. We'll get into that. It was Musui. He wrote a book. I had to read this while I was in grad school. Um, his autobiography, and it starts off, the preface of this book is written to his grandchildren. And it is this list of things that you should do to be honorable. And it's this about, it's, you know, avoiding gambling and uh, making sure that you're studying well and obeying your elders and all of these wonderful things that you would expect a grandfather tells grandchildren. And then it kind of ends with, anyway, here's how I didn't do any of that. <laughs> so, Katsu Koikichi, he was a, I mean, he was in a samurai family that was actually fairly well to do, um, but he was quite a jerk, to put it lightly. Um, even as a kid, one of the passages that I recall very much is um, he, of course, like all other samurai youth of his age, had to go and do, um, he went to the dojo, did all the fighting training, as all the boys did, and one of the, he just annoyed the crap out of everyone there. None of the kids liked him, and he made a big point about that. Like, they were, he said they all bullied him. I have a feeling a lot of it was the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, it was a big thing where when a boy reached a certain age, they were allowed to have like an all-night training session at the dojo. It was a bit like they would all go bring dinner, and they would just have this all-night, think of it like a samurai slumber party, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, well, he annoyed the other boys so much during this that before their dinner, they decided to tie him to the roof. So he was dangling from the roof. They ripped off his leg. And for some, for some reason, he wasn't wearing pants, and that is part of the story. I don't know why. Um, and he is very pissed off that they are not untying him. Dinner gets served. They're not untying him. And he is so mad, he just goes and he pees on all the food. <laughs> and he, he kind of takes that as a win. Just like, yeah, look at all the stuff I did. So he grows up, and because he wasn't great in studying, he kind of burned all of his bridges. He's having a really hard time getting a job, so he starts frequenting with the dice gamblers. So he's not really a Yakuza, but he's kind of in that, that gray area until he eventually is a full-blown Yakuza and is making a ton of money just extorting people. Great samurai, right? <laughs> So he's extorting people, and then he makes this big deal. Like he, he is the boss of the neighborhood. Like everybody comes to him for advice, mostly because they all owe him money at some point. Um, his grown children get really annoyed with his terrible behavior, so they build a cage and stick him in there, and he is imprisoned in their living room for two years. <laughs> During this two years, he gets really bored and goes, hey, you know what? I should learn how to read at some point. <laughs> so he did that. And after he learned how to read, he would read books and go, you know what, this book sucks. I'm going to write my own book. So he wrote the book he did today. Um, and it's honestly, to me, reading it, I find it really funny because it reads like a 12-year-old trying to uh, make himself be like, imagine like a, like Deku, writing a book before he has his superpowers and it's all this you know and i saved everyone i'm so cool yeah that's the whole book it's great it's really it's really really like I mean, to me it was funny but that's because i'm i'm a nerd about history so that's part of that all right so he was definitely a samurai bully he was not the only one samurais were absolutely bullies because they were so high class, they could pretty much do whatever they wanted. You got a new sword, you see a peasant in the street, you go, hey, I wonder if this blade's sharp. Sharp. My peasant. Yeah, he's not gonna get in trouble for that. Why? He killed a peasant. There's a million peasants who care about them. Not joking. Yeah, it was perfectly legal for a samurai to test their sword by killing someone in the middle of the street in broad daylight. And it happened. They could also kill a fellow samurai as long as they issued a warning. And by issuing a warning, you go to your local police station and say, hey, I really want to kill this dude. And they say, okay. So they post a notice out saying, hey, this dude is going to kill that dude. And that way, 
Your victim knows, and they've got some time to get out of Dodge. And after a certain amount of time, if you can't find your target, the, the vendetta expired, and you can't go and kill them anymore. You have to go and get a new one, and after the first one, they just kind of go, why didn't you kill them the first time? What kind of samurai are you again? This, one of these vendettas is actually, um, is very lovingly detailed in Mori Ogai, who we'll talk about in a bit. He has a, the vendetta at Gojinkara. Um, it was about two families. One family killed the head of the other. And so the victim's family uh, issued a vendetta against the head of the other family. And the head of the other family caught wind of this really early and he fled couldn't find him. So the entire thing, it is uh, going over the journey that this family took to try and find this guy so that they could kill him and finish the vendetta. They couldn't find him. And so afterwards, this is near the end of the time for the vendetta, like, like a day or two before they returned to their home. And it's just like, you know what? We tried, we did what we could, you know, we, we really wanted to restore our family. And uh, the daughter of the, the, of the victim, is just walking in the street one day, sees the guy, she's got her sword, goodbye. <laughs> He's gone. So that's actually kind of a really surprising one because most of these vendetta stories, it's all about the men fighting each other and killing each other. This is one of the very few I can find where a woman actually deals the final blow, um, which is really sad because samurai women were awesome and we will get into why they were not actually right now. So. Early samurai women were extremely educated and they were trained to fight to defend their homes. This is because the men, this is prior to Edo, the men were all off always fighting something. So there had to be someone at home to defend the house, defend the kids, the property, all of that. So the women learned how to fight. In fact, we got goes in Tomoe, Hojo Masako, and Nakano Takeko. They were actually riding alongside in battle with their husbands. Gozen Tomoe, in uh, particular, she was actually a general. She was ordering all these guys around. She was well known for being this amazing, courageous general who was a brilliant strategist and had a lot of respect. They managed the property, they managed the households, they did all the finances, they took care of the children. When the men weren't at home, they were the rulers of the household. They took care of absolutely everything. They were also allowed to own property until the Edo period. Again, we're getting back into there are no more jobs, there's nothing to do, and the men go, well, I'm a manly man, 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 I need the job, you don't get to have one. I am now going to use my daughter as a way to get a higher status in society. So you, you're gonna marry this old dude because he's got lots of money. So by the time the Edo period came around, women were still in the samurai class, but their job was essentially being cattle. Not cool. Um, they're, yeah, they're used for marriages and clan alliances, and it was not a great time. But in case you don't believe me about the samurai fighters, here they are. The paint, the uh, woodblock paint that goes in Tomoe. The next one is a still from a movie. Uh, the photograph is an unknown samurai woman, and I believe that the woman on the horse is supposed to be Hojo Masako. I don't quite remember. It's been a while since I've actually made this panel. So. There was a lot of them. They did some really cool things until, I mean, peace is wonderful, but it didn't actually have that great of an effect on a lot of people. All right, now that we've gotten into the roles, the weapons. What was the most common samurai weapon? The katana, yeah, the dick, yeah, I wish, no. All right, the katana. However, most katanas were show pieces. They were very old, they were very expensive, they are very heavy, they are very hard to wield. Um, the, most of the time, if they were using a sword, they'd be using the shorter sword because it allows for better movement. Um, a starting price for a katana made in 2015 was uh, $4,000. So if you're, so, uh, just, just letting you know that um, Texas might have open carry swords. Please do not carry on a katana. They are dangerous, and yours is fake. <laughs> if you bought it in the dealer's room, sorry, it's fake. <laughs> just saying. Um, yeah, they were. They were just. They were huge. They were heavy. 
those of you who have ever done any sort of martial art or any sort of stage combat like I have, the larger the sword, the more limited your movement. And when you are in a close quarters fight, you do not want to be holding around, say, Cloud's Buster Sword because it's not going to end very well for you. Really too busy trying to uh, lift it up. More commonly weapon-wise were bow and arrow. That was a big one. Um, it's still a big one today. It's called Kudo. It is a uh, that's Japanese archery. I actually have a friend who does it. It's really cool. Um, and if you want some really fun stuff for that one, generally it is men who do the archery even to this day. And what the women do is they're wearing these beautiful kimonos. They are kneeling behind the dude. And once the dude fires the arrow, they wait. And then they go and they pick up the stray arrows and bring them back. <laughs> That is changing though, there are a lot more women doing Kudo. Um, I never had the arm strength for it, but it looked really cool. Um, on the top, the top photo, that is a ancient rocket launcher. <laughs> so these were really popular for long range combat. Again, if you are in a war or a fight, you probably want to try to get away from the people with the bang bangs and the boom booms. So. You have your own, and yeah, that is actually, that was in a, that's in a museum, um, and how it worked, um, it worked honestly like a cannon. Actually, there was a projectile in there, um, and then it would fire, it was usually on fire, and it caused some massive destruction, which is what you want if you're trying to fight someone away. And surprisingly, and no one believes me with this one, guns. Guns were huge in samurai culture. Once a gun, guns were introduced to Japan by the West um, during, I believe it was from the Dutch. I'm trying to remember my dates exactly. Um, guns were very, very expensive, but they were easier to maintain and they were easier to use than a katana, even though at the time we're talking like the one or two bullet ones where you have to reload and do all the powder and all that great stuff. Um, it was a real status symbol. Guns were, if you wanted to impress someone, you would gift them with a gun. Um, these were actually also uh, normally gifts for men. Some women did learn how to use them, but it was mostly the men. That is a still from Samurai Champloo with them holding the guns. A lot of people thought that was anachronistic. Uh, it's not, they used them, used them a lot. Uh, of course, nowadays in Japan, there really aren't any guns left, unless you're going hunting and there's a whole thing. And I just gave the entire uh, law about guns in Japan in my last panel. So, there's a lot of that going on. All right, so you grow up, you do your fighting. Your later samurai life, everybody becomes an under monk. I'm serious. Um, so that was the thing to do for the older samurai is that you know, they're getting up in years, they're trying to be more like the elder statesman type. Um, so they took vows to become a Buddhist nun or a monk. It's all supposed to be good karma for you for your next life. Um, so they took their vows, they took their spiritual names. We saw on my slide with Katsukoikichi, you saw Musui in there, that was a spiritual name. Um, they took all the vows that regular nuns and monks do, the, the poverty, the chastity, the obedience, they never actually follow them, especially not the chastity one. <laughs> so becoming a Buddhist holy person was the TikTok trend of the 1600s. <laughs> that was the popular thing to do. But not only was it just you did it because everyone else was doing it, now I can hear my mother in my head going, well, if you jump, if some of my friend jumped off a bridge, would you go do it too? But it helped you, it also helped someone select their death name. Um, in ancient Japanese culture, you had your name while you were alive, and then once you died, they changed your name to, it's, a, it's another karma point thing, because the more complicated your death name was, but number one, the more expensive it is, and number two, because it's more expensive, you're giving more money to the temple. Because you're giving more money to the temple, the gods just be like, hey, that guy's really, really generous. Keeping in mind that the dude is dead and had nothing to do with this. So, with death, I'm sure you've all heard the death before dishonor or possibly death before torture or more death. Um, the, the glamorization of suicide among samurai, a lot of it comes from samurai being captured in battle and realizing they're gonna torture me and they're gonna kill me. Why don't I just beat them to the punch? 
So suicides were generally happen in a few ways. Um, on occasion, actually on more than one occasion, a master would uh, volunteer their samurai to go and go and commit suicide. You know, didn't always have a say in the matter. Um, so the traditional way, what was supposed to happen was that the samurai, and right there I actually have a samurai there writing his death poem, um, they would eat a final meal, which would have sliced pickles, because that is a pun referring to cut flesh. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, could, could you imagine that, like, having cut pickles and be like, hey, this is to symbolize the fact you're going to cut yourself open. Isn't that great? So they had the cup pickles there, so they would eat the dinner. Then they would compose their death poem. Um, some of these are very beautiful. In fact, the one uh, that this dude is writing is up in the corner. Do not, please don't ask me to read it because I can't read the calligraphy. I tried. Um, and then after all of that, he would uh, change into a white kimono because that is the color of death. Uh, they would go into a room where they would be, if it was a, um, a samurai who was in service to a lord would be there. Um, there'd be lots of this. There'd be like lots of people viewing it, kind of like an execution. Um, and then the samurai would read their death poem, and then there was a knife placed in front of them. They would reach for the knife, and traditionally, they were supposed to make a cut across their stomach left to right, then take the knife, turn it upwards, and go the other way. Ouch. Now, it is very, very hard to try and stab yourself because our brains just go, what? we should not be doing this. This is real bad. It's real hard. So people realize that. So, and that is where, so again, traditionally they would do the cuts and then uh, another guy would come in, chop off your head. So what actually happened for the most part is that there would usually be a signal. Um, for example, the samurai would say, pick up the knife, and then the second would step in and chop off your head, or they would make like a very superficial cut to for the symbolism, and then the next person finishes the job. Um, in the case of people who they were afraid would take that knife and immediately just go and attack, like just go and attack everybody in the room, they would replace the knife with a paper fan so that that way they wouldn't have a weapon available to just go on a rampage for it. And honestly, I, if I was voluntold, as a lot of these people were, um, I would probably feel the same way, honestly. So this was first viewed and reported by Westerners after the Sakai incident. I'm just going to do a quick overview about that. Um, there were a, uh, a group of French sailors, and uh, the rule at the time was that the um, Europeans could not go into the towns um, for fear of, you know, they wanted to protect the people in the town. Well, uh, 29 French sailors decided, sorry, it was 11 French sailors, they decided to uh, go out and ignore that and go and do their thing. They went to the town, um, there were reports of um, assaults happening, all kinds of not great stuff. So the 20, there are 29 guards from the Tosa clan. They were the city guards. They went and killed all of the, the soldiers, all, all the sailors. The French government was naturally outraged by this and they go and they demanded money. They demanded an apology. They demanded that all of these guards be executed. And execution in, the, in Europe, of course, is quite different than the ones in Japan. So. They bring them in like, okay, I'm gonna do it. So they bring them in um, one at a time. The, uh, and the, the guards were well aware, like they were, they knew when I said that they were protecting their town. So they were all about doing the full thing. They said, do not start cutting off my head when I reach for the knife. No, I'm gonna do the full cuts. So the first two do the full cuts before the head chopping. So there are entrails all over the place. It is disgusting. The French foreign minister is so like horrified by this that he immediately begs the Japanese government to stop the executions right away. So out of the 29, only two were killed. This is also very lovingly detailed by Mori Oga, and while I love this guy to bits, um, he had some really, really interesting views of uh, what a samurai should do. But anyway, with that one, what really killed me with that was that with the uh, 
the narration, I'm sorry, I'm, my allergies are acting up, I'm kind of nasal today. Um, with the narration, uh, one of the parts was he had the, the samurai guards, there was a couple that were brothers, an older brother, younger brother. And the older brother, well the younger brother pointed to a barrel, which is the barrels that they were using to carry out the bodies after the deed was done, and he just go, hey, hey look, that's the big one, that's for you bro, and I think that smaller one, that's for me, and he usually like, seemed so damn happy about this. The brothers were ones that survived though. All right, so let's go into our perception of samurai and where it comes from. It comes from, from this dude, Nito de Inazo. He wrote the book Bushido in 1897. What? <laughs> this hundreds and hundreds of like years old art was written in 1897. <clears throat> that. Honestly, I feel bad for him. So, Nito Bay was a, he was an academic, um, and he was being exposed to a lot of Western culture, because this was the, really at this time, a lot of globalization is happening. So he's seeing a lot of Western art. He is seeing opera. He is seeing all of these, like, dances, all of this stuff. And he has the mistaken idea that Japanese fine art does not compare to European fine art. That's used a peasant art as opposed to say like Rembrandt or Degas or any of that. So he starts thinking, what does Japan have that the West doesn't have? And he goes, Bushido. Now the word Bushido existed in Japan. Um, it wasn't in very common use, however. It's not something you would hear just like walking down the street for a very long time. So he decides to write a book about Bushido and publish it and send it all over the world. He did a couple of things though. First thing he did was he decided to write the book entirely in English. Because he went, I don't want Japanese academics to read my book. I might not be telling the whole story. So he writes this book. It gets published. It gets sent all over. He kind of forgot that his fellow academics also spoke English. And they read the book and they're just like, yeah, none of this happened. What the hell is this? And this book gets ignored for the next 80 years. Now, what happened was the post-war economic miracle in Japan. So, after the war, Japan starts becoming the real leader in manufacturing. You know, your TVs, your Nintendos, your animes, your video games, all that good stuff. And a lot of people in the West are going, how on earth did Japan go from being like super poor and desolate after the war to this giant economic superpower? And they went, well, we got this book called Bushido. This is where, it's, it's because of Bushido, that's why. So he kind of, Nijime kind of coined the word Bushido. It just wasn't really in popular use until the 1980s. It's more of like an academic term than anything else. So here's a few things that are in the uh, in Bushido that sound probably very familiar to those of you who grew up in a Christian household. Rectitude, courage, benevolence, politeness, veracity, honor, loyalty, character, sounds a lot like the Ten Commandments. <laughs> so what Nito they did, part of the thing with Bushido is that he knew that a lot of uh, Japanese ideals did not translate very well to the current Western culture. So because he was an academic, he was familiar with the Bible and decided to apply tenets from the Bible into his version of Bushido so that people would find it more palatable and go, you know what, that's a good thing. So it's, I mean, it's kind of a bit like, like that. <laughs> <laughs> so he went over and he was trying to, um, and it worked. Um, a lot of people say one of the big things with Bushido that you'll see a lot is um, being respectful to your parents. Honor thy mother and father. <laughs> Be respectful of other people's things. Thou shalt not steal. <laughs> Don't murder people. Thou shalt not kill. See, see, it's just going and going and going. So he's using Western ideals in an Eastern context to make Japan seem more interesting to the West. Which when I think about it, it just goes, that's kind of messed up. Just a little bit. 
He wasn't the only one though. So let me go into my Mori Ogai. All right, so he was a Meiji era writer. However, he was born near the end of the Edo period. He was born into a samurai family of doctors. So again, samurai could literally be anything. And just as a quick side note, um, I have a good friend of mine in Japan who um, he was really interested in genealogy and he knew that his family were samurai class and so he decided to trace, like he was feeling they were tracing things back and they were actually able to trace his family back to a castle near, um, actually near Mount Fuji um, and his entire family were all accountants. <laughs> but they were still samurai because they were working for, they were working for the daimyo in the castle. So, the, um, the samurai class dissolves when Mori Ogai is an adult, um, and he becomes an author, because I mean, there's not a, what do you do after your guaranteed positions uh, disappear? Write a book. Mm -hmm. Apparently that's a cool thing to do. Um, he actually trained to be a doctor, decided he didn't like it so much. Um, he traveled, I believe, to Germany, and used that experience to start becoming an author. He became really well known for contemporary fiction. He would do, he did a lot of really interesting uh, short stories about Meiji era life. Spoiler alert: they are all very, very dark and dreary, mm -hmm. but they are actually really cool. Um, but a lot of it was just um, about Japan adjusting from this super strict hierarchy into well, there's no such thing as a hierarchy anymore. You go do you. Um, after 1912 is when he starts writing his, uh, his historical fiction. What's happening in the world around 1912? Ding, ding, ding. This is the first, World War I is the first entry in, uh, of Japan onto the, um, the world stage as a battling, mil as a military power. Um, so what we're ha what's happening here is that Ogai, and along with a lot of other Meiji writers, they stop writing about their daily lives and contemporary subjects and start delving into historical fiction because what that's doing, that is driving up nationalism. That is driving more patriotism, that is getting people really pumped up so they will go and they will fight and die for their country just like all these ancient romanticized samurai did. So that's where we get a lot of that. I will say though, if you do have any interest in Meiji fiction, definitely pick him up. Um, also, not some, actually, uh, Sosaki as well, but he did less samurai, more just really weird stuff. All right, so is it really Bullshido? So there, even though like I have been ragging on samurai for the last uh, about 40 minutes and I will continue to rag on them to my dying day because that's fun. They did have a moral code, and the moral code existed like they exist today. They are rules for society, you know. Try not to kill anyone, don't steal stuff, you know, be, be polite to people. But the idea of Bushido was completely impractical for historical samurai. Like this thing like King Arthur, the, the, the code of chivalry for knights. It's an ideal, it was never upheld. And it's the same thing. Again, I'm, I'm going back to the, the Bible as well. I mean, people who are Christians are told, you know, be kind, you know, walk like Jesus, do this and this and this, and it doesn't always work so well. So our Bushido today is combining Christian morality with Japanese tradition, as I was saying, to make it easier for a Western audience to understand. So honestly, Bushido as we know it, is bullshit up. <laughs> I like animations, what can I say? One thing though that I love putting out to are these samurai we find in media. I am sure, raise your hand if you have watched an anime with a samurai and you are all about how awesome it is, fantastic. We're gonna talk about my favorite, Samurai Shell Blue. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I did not know this until after I watched it as like in college. I was like, this is so cool and Gene's so awesome. And then I started researching Samurai and I watched the show again. Gene is the Nitobe Bushido. He is upholding all of the laws that he is supposed to. He is the silent, stoic samurai that all the girls are going after, that, you know, he has this thing, you know, the 
the, the married to the sea type, you know, it's like, I'm, I have my duty, I must do it. I am disgraced because I killed my master, all, all of this drama. And you'll notice as well in the show that the other samurai treat him like he's a weirdo. And that's because he is. <laughs> For this time period, he would, he, it would, he's the creepy, like super religious dude who's doing like all of this stuff and you're just going, uh, I didn't ask, I just wanted to know if you wanted to go to McDonald's for lunch. <laughs> that kind of dude. I mean, I still, I still love Samurai Shamblu, it's one of my favorites, and despite all of the anachronisms, and don't get me started on the Kabagi episode because I will yell for 20 minutes about how that curtain is wrong. Um, <laughs> it's wrong. That kind of curtain was not developed until the 18, until 1820 after Ulysses S. Grant saw, actually no, 1860, after Ulysses and Grant saw, went to Japan, saw a couple key play, and donated that curtain as a gift. All right, sorry, end of rant. <laughs> I get into it. Okay, and I also I totally had the dates wrong. Um, sorry, my, my brain is fried. I've been here since uh, Thursday evening going nuts. All right, moving on. Another very famous samurai that people love. We've got Kenshin. Love Kenshin, he's amazing. He's actually closer to the um, historical depiction of a samurai than Jean is, because I mean, Kenshi doesn't really follow the, um, the idea of Bushido that Nito Bay put out. He's got his own deals, he's got his own goals going on. Um, I mean, and also too, the time period that they put him at, the very end, at that, that real switch of time periods um, that really affects his character. So I love Kenshin. I mean, honestly, I, I, I've got a lot of these old dudes that I love, but um, yeah, he's, he's, he's a pretty cool one. And since someone brought up Tom Cruise, here he is. Oh. Here's that guy. Oh. Oh. All right, no, no, so I do bring him up. So Last Samurai is one of my guilty pleasures. Um, and the, and the reason why is because people don't associate the time periods. People don't think samurai were existing at the same time the Civil War is going on. In fact, like there's a, a thing I saw, I think it was probably like on Tumblr or something, where he put out you could have a samurai and a Civil War soldier and a Caribbean pirate forming a really cool D&D party and be historically accurate. So, that's why I really like it. And also too, even though this is Tom Cruise, you know, the white American savior of Japan that we've got here, he's actually, again, closer to the historical samurai. I mean, Watanabe's character is more of the, the Bushido type, um, but he's uh, the rough and scrappy, go in there, stab everybody, get out as fast as you can kind of dude who gets real drunk half the time. Um, but that's why I put him in there. And for a lot of people, The Last Samurai was a their first introduction into the um, ancient Jap Japanese history as a form of media. Like it's it was a really interesting. Like this was again, I'm dating myself. Uh, you know, back when dinosaurs were on the earth, and this movie came out, um, a lot of people had no idea what a samurai was. Like at least at least in uh, rural Mississippi in the early 2000s. So. Just saying. All right, that is actually what I've got. So I am, I have not watched a ton of anime for like the last <coughs> years. Uh, what other examples can you think of? What other kind of samurai? Any kind of questions, comments you got? What's going on here? All right, yes. Mine is less anime driven and more liter literary. Um, have you ever read The Tales of the Atori by Leanne Hearn? I have not. I've not heard of that. Okay. I guess I was going to ask your opinion on how she captures that kind of uh, warring states mentality. Um, and then also, uh, there's kind of a sense of brutalism behind the scenes. Uh, okay. With the being presented and depicted. And I guess I was going to ask your opinion. So. All right. Interesting. I will, no, I, that's actually, I will have to look that up. Um, I, warring states is not my, that's like my real fuzzy period of Japanese history. My focus was primarily on late Edo when I was in, in graduate school. But um, yeah, I will definitely look that up. This is really cool. Well, Thank you. Fiction. There's just yeah. a lot of correlation. Oh, I love fiction. That's, that's fine. I would be interested to know what you think about how they kind of capture the themes of it all. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you for the rec. I'll definitely look into that. All right. What you got for me back there? Samurai Troopers and its adaptation to Roman Warriors in the West. 
Mm -hmm. I do, yeah, I, I do remember that, um, but I have not watched that in many, 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 many years. Yeah. Oh, and it totally slipped my mind. I forgot to say, normally I do this panel with uh, Moose, who is our current San Japan chair. However, he had to back out at the last minute because he said he had to do more important things like get closing ceremonies ready and pay people who have to be paid. No, all that stuff that's not as important as this. <laughs> so, I had to bring that up there. All right, what you got for me? And then the wig in the back, yeah. Oh, Samurai Jack. Yeah. Samurai Jack. I love Samurai Jack. Good choice. Good choice. Samurai Jack is a, it's really interesting because it's um, the, and again, this is a real step into kids getting their first real glimpse of Samurai. Samurai, like Samurai Jack's really like, it's, it's played for laughs more than anything else. And again, I'm going back to my memories as a kid versus, um, me like going back and revisiting a lot of this as an adult but it's more like you know it's done for laughs and honestly a lot of the yeah. the samurai stuff kind of fits into it oh awesome yeah. sweet yeah. all right we've got a lot of samurai jackets in here all right fantastic yes sir sorry what bushido brown i am not familiar with that one yeah, it's not, no. <laughs> uh, say I don't want to be familiar with this one? No, you do. It's just, it's just not the Ah, oh, okay, okay. So this is just like, ooh, what is that? All right, let's see, in the front, yes. I read, I think, like the first volume of Vagabond. Did you find it uh, interesting? I thought it was interesting, and then I put it down into like 40 other things. Yes, yeah, oh, one of those. Um, I will say as well, uh, there is an older series called Samurai Executioner um, that actually follows the um, the older version of the samurai with really without going into a lot of the bullshito. So it's a it's a better look at how the samurai actually were. And it's done by the same guy who did uh, oh. The, I, I've got to say it wrong. The the the, the wolf was like boy and wolf or something like that. Oh, no. Yeah, Lola Fakal, yeah, that one. It's like it's something with a wolf and a boy. Yeah, mm -hmm. same yeah same, same author. So he really does like a really a lot a lot of good stuff at that time period. All right, what you got? Uh, Yoshikawa's Musashi. Have you ever picked it up? A long time ago. What, do, you, do you remember what you thought about it and how they kind of captured? Musashi really isn't one of my main interests. Um, I mean, the Five Rings is kind of interesting, but uh, I don't know. I, I get I get titchy reading a lot of manga, um, especially just because I mean, it's good, but that's how it is. Um, I remember I did like it. Um, I thought it I thought it had a lot of uh, it really stuck to the historical Musashi versus um, our more romanticized version of it. Yeah, I, I asked because the story you told towards the beginning uh, about the fellow who was tied to the tree, but also uh, in the cage and the families, that's very parallel to what happens in the, the Musashi epic. He kind of has an experience like that where he meets a monk and the monk kind of judges him for being a, a douchebag. Yeah. He's tied <laughs> to the tree for a while and then actually locks him in a closet until he gets the shit together. Yeah, so although it did. I, actually, oh man, I forgot with with uh, Musui. If you ever do pick up Musui's uh, autobiography, um, there is a um, a very long and detailed passage about the time a dog bit his testicles, <laughs> <laughs> and he spends like good two or three pages talking about this injury and about how strong he was because he didn't cry from the pain. And then people just get this, like, this gory description about like what's happening. And then, and then later in the book, many years later, he has his child, he has his son. Well, my son had a testicle injury and then this has, yeah, he's, he's kind of obsessed with it. So fair warning with that one. Yeah. I, I mean, he had kids, so apparently they worked. But do, do we want them to work? Maybe not. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, yeah, there's, there, there's, there's quite a bit of that. Um, if you do also as well, if you're interested in looking into the, um, actually I might do a panel on Yakuza at some point. Um, if you do end up wanting to look at more of the evolution of Samurai to Yakuza, there is another wonderful, wonderful book called The Confessions of a Yakuza, and it's actually one of the first real, one of the ones who's actually um, the dice gambler, like one of the first ones prior, like after the um, the end of the Edo period. And it's uh, it's all transcriptions, it's all records from a doctor who was treating this. Uh, dying former samurai yakuza dude who was like well into his this this is like in the 1920s and like this is like he's like well into his 90s and he's dying and giving these really interesting accounts of what life was like in that real change period um it's a really interesting that that early meiji late edo period is one of my favorite periods of japanese history because of this switch from this super formal super structure to and all hell breaks loose. You're free. You can do it now. Alright, what you got for me? I'm sorry, what? You said it sounded like you kill a president with unity. Mm-hmm. So what would happen if they just killed the samurai right afterwards or the president managed to kill the samurai and bring himself? If the peasant managed to kill the samurai uh, defending himself, that peasant was going to be frog marched straight to the execution grounds. He killed a samurai. He went above his class. Now, again, the samurai killing the samurai, as long as he told him first, hey, I'm going to kill you, then it was okay. Now, the other samurai killed him without saying, hey, I'm going to kill you, then there's going to be a bit of trouble. It's going to be more like a, hey, brah, you're not supposed to do that. You know the rules. Next time, leave a note. <laughs> All right, what you got? I have a silly question. The helmet, it's called Tabuka, right? Yeah. Is, is the helmet named after the bug, or is the bug named after the helmet? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It was it was patterned after the the beetle because of the the shell, um, but they're kind of it's kind of I forgot there was an actual there was like a an older name for it and I can't remember but colloquially it started being called the the Kabuto. Um, again, I'm like reaching back into my depths of my very limited understanding of archaic Japanese, and I assure you it's like this big, but. Yeah, no, it's it was it was both. It really was both with that. Um, that's just that's honestly how etymology works. There's nothing with my pet passions. Um, that's I'm an English teacher. My kids hate me because I go straight into all these details about why you should know what this word means because you know this part and this part and this part. Yeah, actually they love me. It's all right. Okay. Yes. You mentioned that the Meiji era was possibly your favorite uh, era in Japanese history. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about the Beam Slayer War from Beam Slayer uh, being represented? Demon Slayer is interesting because it's supposed to be taking place during Taisho, right? Yeah. 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 So Taisho is the 1920s. Um, that is well after all the samurai stuff happened. But people are still like the older generation in particular that they're still going to remember. Whoops, that was not supposed to go. That was a uh, sorry, my computer fell asleep for a second. Um, that was. Uh, <clears throat> I thought it was actually really interesting because you don't really see a lot of anime set in Taisho. Um, so honestly, like, like some of the recollections and the flashbacks to Samurai were um, quite good. A lot of the more recent anime are embracing like the actual history of it versus the Nito Bay history. Um, it was actually it was really cool seeing it, honestly. I need to go back and watch that again. That was a good show. Okay. What you got? Is there a way to convince people that the uh, Samurai had guns back in the end of period? Well, there's this episode of Samurai Shampoo. Um, <laughs> honestly, it's really, really difficult to convince someone that samurai did use guns because of the way that uh, we we see the samurais having the giant swords and these epic battles. Thanks, anime. Um, and that is part of it. Well, anime like the woodblock prints and all of that. Um, okay. <laughs> honestly, the best thing you can do is, and this is going to be really, really hard because we're in San Antonio, but um, you can try to find, um, I know the Witty used to have this, I think, or was it the San Antonio Museum of Art? I know, I like museums. 
um, try to find a, uh, a museum that is doing a display of ancient Japanese weapons. You can find it online as well if you're just trying to sell like, no, no, dude, really, really, they use guns, bang, bang. Um, because they actually did, and uh, one of the things that I did, if you really want to go into academia and go into the gun history, there is a wonderful essay called Do Guns Have Gender? that go into <laughs> the um, implications in ancient Japan of giving a woman a gun. It was actually really good. Princess Mononoke talks about Mononoke, yes, Mononoke talks about the guns, yeah. And that actually, I think, because the, in the very vague time period that Mononoke takes place, I believe it was supposed to be like a real introduction of guns in there. All right, I've got a couple of minutes left. So, thank you very much for coming out. I really appreciate it. I'll be there. this year. We really appreciate it. Uh, if you want to volunteer, you should do that too. Just saying. We're cool people. All right. Thank you so much. Y'all have a good afternoon.